podcasting from Chico, California. This is the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast, where we discuss fly fishing, guiding, fishery science and management, conservation, and more. Know better. Fish better. Learn more at barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. This episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast is brought to you by California Trout working throughout the state to ensure we have resilient wild fish thriving in healthy waters for a better California. Support Caltrout's innovative science-based work by becoming a member or donating today at caltrout.org. All right. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast. I said it backwards there a second ago, so I had to restart it. We should, we should keep <laughs> I'm it. One, keep it. <laughs> I'm uh, one of your hosts, Nick Hanna. I'm here with Chad Alderson. Chad, how we doing, man? I'm good. How are you? So awesome. Awesome. I'm actually pumped on this episode because it's a, a species spotlight. Species uh, spotlight. I know for steelhead. I, and the reason I said it like that is because I, I, I was, I had my GoPro rolling one time on a river and I, I was getting, I was confronted by the man. He was, he was strapping me down for something. And, and I, I, I repeated, I said, invasive pieces it, <laughs> on air. And he, he was nervous. He was yeah. like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, cool episode, fun episode um, on Steelhead. Obviously, we're getting close to that time of year. I think that uh, everybody loves, um, you know, pe- men and women all over the world um, love to chase these fish. And I don't know, wh- I don't know what it is about them. Uh, if it's the beautiful places that it takes you to, or if it's the just the Steelhead itself that draws these anglers in around the world. But steel- I know for me. I know why steelhead are, are just a, a magical creature. And, and, uh, you know, Yvonne Chenardi says the cure to depression is action. And, um, I, I think I'd take that a step further and say the cure to depression is steelhead and, and they, they are action. You know, when you, when we go to chase them, they do things that as an angler, you've never seen before. And, um, who we got on today is, uh, is a guy who views them both above water and below water. Um, John McMillan, is that right? Did I pronounce your last name right? You got it. Yeah. So it was funny because, um, the only, how I met John is through Instagram. I, I saw some of his posts he was doing and I'm like, this guy's passion for steelhead. It goes beyond what, what most people. And then you shared it with me experience. And, and so I, I took a, a just a gut reaction said, hey, we need to get this guy on the show Dude. and, and uh, just talking to him for a few minutes. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we did. Cause I think we got some, some good information for you guys to, to talk about. And, and that's the episode digest. <laughs> <laughs> So, it, John, introduce yourself because I know we have obviously haven't, but, haven't really but met. But, John, and, don't give up too much info, okay? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. Give up as much as you want. <laughs> yeah, you guys are awesome. So, uh, yeah, my name's John McMillan, and uh, I've worked professionally as a, as a scientist studying steelhead and salmon for about 22 years. I currently work for Trout Unlimited, and I'm the steelhead science director for our wild steelhead initiative, which means rather than working in Oregon and Washington, which I've, you know, traditionally kind of been my home, home States, you know, I, I've branched out a little bit into California, Idaho and, and Alaska. So it's a, a lot of fun. And on top of that, you know, the, the reason I became a scientist is because I grew up uh, in a family of steelhead anglers. And, uh, so I've been steelhead fishing since I was a young boy and really love these fish, man. Um, mean the world to me. And did your, did your grandfather do it as well? Yeah, my grandfather. So yeah, yeah. My great grandfather moved out and homesteaded around Oregon city. And then my grandfather, you know, he fished my grandfather and his brother, mostly gear fish, but they took up fly fishing on the Deschutes river in Oregon long before it had a dam on it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And then, you know, it kind of trickled over to my dad. So I've been in a long line of, of anglers. Do you think if your, um, your great grandfather was resurrected and saw a bobber, on the end of your, your gear, would he freak out? I think he would be shocked by it. <laughs> but yeah. I think what, I think what would shock him even more is the fact that we'd probably let the fish go and he'd be like, where's my stringer? <laughs> right? He's so like two, two aneurysms one, in one glance. One evil for another, huh? <laughs> it's true. I've got, got those old pictures of my grandfather and his brother, you know, on the Deschutes and other rivers, just, you know, stringers of trout and steelhead, right? It's right. just, uh, was, was the way they operated. Well, to, so what the heck is, what is a steelhead for some, we have a lot of new, uh, fly fishermen and fishermen on our show. I mean, can you explain to our listeners what, a, what a steelhead is? I think 
to me, and we can, we'll go into this, you know, the fact that you can find them in, in Russia yeah. to Alaska, down our no North American coastline, all the way to Baja kind of shows, um, how resilient and awesome yeah. these, let, these fish are. Let, let's be careful though, not to spend too much time on the life history because we did do that full episode on how right. a trout becomes a steelhead, yeah. which we'll, we'll put as a relationship on the, on the website. So, John, you're off the hook in terms of having to give us a detailed synopsis of life history of Steelhead because we already have done that. We got a, like cool. an hour and a half episode that's kick ass. Um, I listened to that; it was really good. I sent him a link. On oh, good. Yeah. Good. yeah. yeah okay. So, yeah, just just keep that in mind and go for it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I'll keep it really simple, guys. A steelhead, at its most fundamental form, is just a rainbow trout that goes to the ocean, and that's it. You know, um, there's different genes underlying a lot of these life histories and the decisions they ultimately make in terms of what life history they they might be but really technically a steelhead is just a rainbow trout that goes out to the ocean and comes back and when when biologists talk of life history um it's kind of like you're standing in a hall and there's eight different doors you can select in terms of how you're going to end up dying is that is that like is that basically it like it's just this yeah you, you pick a you pick a path and you and then that's your de that's your destiny or your destination yeah basically a life history is just a solution to surviving and reproducing in an environment and because environments are so different you know mm -hmm. the solutions can vary extensively within a watershed so you're right a great analogy is a hallway with eight doors and if you put a bunch of us in there when we were in kindergarten, it's going to show some of those kids are going to take the door. They don't graduate high school. Some of those kids are going to take the door and go to college, right? Some yeah. of the kids are going to take the door and be millionaires. And yeah. so all of those are our life histories. But yeah. yeah. If you break down that history a little bit, um, I think I've talked about this, but I've always told people, you know, my, my hypothesis or my theory is that, you know, during the ice, you know, back when the earth was frozen, right? And rainbow trout were first. And then as the snow or ice began to melt, it flushed these trout out to the ocean and they adapted to become steelhead. Is, is that a safe hypothesis or story that I've been telling all these people? So or? you're, you're positing that, that, that rainbow trout preexisted every other life form. No, 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 I'm no, just, no, I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> I, I, you know, you know, going back in time, it's it's hard. Like we're finding out all the Neanderthal genes that we even have in us as humans, right? So our own right. history is complex, yeah, and right. given the billion billions of dollars we spend on that, it's really hard to go back in time and say exactly what happened. But I think you're generally right that uh, these fish evolved from uh, a life history that was a resident fish that right. didn't go to the ocean, because all the oldest salmonids we have, like whitefish and lanook, they're all resident, right? They don't go to the ocean. And so, uh, and then at some point, and that was likely because the ocean at one point in time was really warm and uninhabitable for salmonids. So the only way to make a livelihood was to be in fresh water, but they did have these big inland brackish waterways. And so they may have, they may have evolved anadromy or the ability to go to the ocean, uh, to take advantage of some of that. So I'm not sure they got blowed out into the ocean per se, but definitely there was something going on with them that as soon as the as soon as the ice age started to kick in and the oceans cooled down, those fish started to go to the ocean. So my hunch is always that when the ice age were at their peak, there were probably certainly steelhead in Mexico. And, you know, there's rivers uh, that drain into. Yeah, you imagine that, dude. There's rivers that drain into Mazatlan that in their headwaters have species of kind of rainbow slash cutthroat that, you know, are really hard to characterize, but, you know, it was easily cold enough during the, the last ice age for fish to hit the ocean in Mexico. And so that would have been uh, interesting, like Mai Tais and Martinis. So they're like, they're like, holdover, they're like genetic <laughs> holdovers from the ice age, basically. Yeah. And they're trapped That's in the, crazy. they're trapped in the upper part of these rivers and yeah and a, a lot of the researchers that were doing work there had to leave because el chapo was running that area up there and el chapo was not you know not wanting people in that area that were american i guess so um hey, john how much I'm, how much time do you have because i've got a, like a ton of questions and i know it's going to go well over an hour and I, know, yeah, well, and I know nick's been chomping at the bit to talk to you for a long long time so how much how much time do you yeah, have, do we have i i I got a couple hours, whatever you guys okay, need. Cool. And so I'll, I'll right. try and I'll try and limit it on the El Chapo and right. the rainbow trout. And so in settle, settle into your seats, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> enjoy your ride. <laughs> Nick's about to take you on a cruise. I think uh, John's going to run this ship. I mean, he's got, he's got all the cool info, but, um, God, it's where, do you, where to start. Where, yeah. Where do you want to start, John? Where do you think, what's the good story intro to this? I, we kind of broke down this, 
um, the history a little bit. Um, coverage. You know, I, th- yeah, I think that I think the range is the first place yeah. to start because yep. that that starts to get into these other questions that you guys have, and they're the same questions that I have too. Totally, because um, you know you find them, you find them again, like I said, in Russia and all these places, you know. And then I, I read some things about um, t- you know the um, glacier fed versus rain fed, and and the differences between those fish. And I'm like, I didn't ever even thought about that, you know, and and the different characteristics that these fish took on on those different environments. So I'm sure that's something that you you would, can go into as well. Yeah, to me, it's pretty amazing. I mean, we talk about why we love steelhead, and there's a couple of reasons I love steelhead. First, that they're when I grew up as a boy, they were in my river, fresh steelhead every month of the year. So it was the only fish that I could what? go out and, and and fish for every every day, right? So they were reliable. They're like a really good girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> to, to a pre you know to a pre adolescent teen, right? You're like that's my replacement. Um, and the other reason is because the they all look so different from river river. You know, we've all caught a lot of King salmon or coho salmon and most of them look pretty similar. Um, so I think those are awesome. And the reason they are so, they are so diverse in the way they look is because they occupy this massive range of habitat that no other salmonid comes close to occupying. And that is from the Kamchatka peninsula up around the, the Pacific rim, all the way down, through the Pacific Northwest, off the coast of California, and then in really wet years, there's still a few steelhead returning to streams in Baja. Wow. Wow. Which is, and then then we're in the interior to Idaho, and cutthroat are kind of the interior dominant trout, but, you know, that's a range that's pretty amazing. Like, Chinook are probably, um, Chinook and Coho come in close, but, you know, pink and sockeye and chum salmon, historically, they kind of ended around the Sacramento river. And we're not even sure how many were in there. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, most of those species and the other interesting, other interesting aspect is since, since we've had all these alterations to the habitat, like the distribution of coho and Chinook is rolled up further, rolled up further North. Right. So it's pink salmon, but, but we still have steelhead like you guys know, in places where yeah. wild Chinook and other salmon are struggling to make it. Yeah. And that, that point you're making about this Northern migration of the, you know, the cone salmon stuff. Um, it's particularly important to know this because there's, we've got a pod of orca whales off of our coast basically that are kind of in this, this no man zone, um, in terms of just having enough protein to subsist. Um, with the way that we, it was described to us is that the, these orcas that are, north and south of this pod they're highly territorial uh creatures and they're not really letting that 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 pod that's like boxed in actually range north or south into their own territories to to feed so my question is do you know and you may not know this because it's it's outside of your 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 scope of what you're studying but do are is there any kind of documentation or anything any any uh record of of Orcas subsisting on steelhead. That's a great question, and I I would hate to say I know because I don't, you know. And no, uh, no worries. M- my guess is that there must be some overlap when these fish are returning to fresh water. But out in the ocean, what we do know is that steelhead are like navy seals out there. Mo- they're moving in groups of one and two and three. Wow. Well, oh. the, the the salmon are like the sheep, right? They're oh. out there in huge, massive groups, and so. Steelhead appear to be one fish that you're probably not going to choose to feed on in the open ocean because you're chasing a needle in a, in a windstorm. That, that's that like the that's like the first time that I've heard that on the show that they they go in these one and two two man teams. It makes like sense because people don't you're not catching them in nets. Right? Well, what, what's and crazy? Every once yeah. in a while you do, but the, the fact that there's not being they're not being caught in big numbers kind yeah, of yeah, validates yeah. that. Well, you know? th- this is. This is really interesting in terms of like if you know how networks, if you know how uh, TCP/IP works and internet protocol works. Um, if I think of a, a single steelhead as a packet, right? The whole reason that the internet was built um, and the levels of redundancy in it that it has in it and, and its reliability is because a single packet of information can can get to the same node on the network, which is like a computer. We're talking about steelhead. I, I know. I'm trying to bring it back. Hold, just bear with me. Um, that, that packet can return, get to that node on the network, but it can take several different paths to get there. So when I say node on the network, 
in you know our space what i'm talking about is the actual river so all these steelhead are out there and they're not really coordinated but they're going off a scent and they just hone in on this one river and all of a sudden the certain times of year they just all kind of like coalesce and funnel up into this into this uh river that's crazy i thought until today that they just kind of went in packs and they kind of stuck with the pack and it was more of a sheep mentality like you're saying I, I love the metaphors and analogies for understanding this. I mean, it's it's like they have different strategies, right? Like the salmon strategy is kind of like a pelagic fish, an ocean fish or a lake fish. They're going to be out there and they rely on numbers, right? You know, confusion and the fact that I hope my buddy to the left gets killed and not me. And the steelhead are different. They're like, you know, I don't want them to see me. I don't want them to look at me. I'm I'm kind of shy and solitary. Um, so definitely a different behavior. That's a trip, man. And I, I think the Navy SEAL analogy is pretty much perfect. Yeah, that's cool. They'll that's just cool. sneak up on your boat and cut your throat. Totally, right? I mean, yeah. if they were the Navy SEALs of the world, they'd probably be screwed considering all the crap they've already survived. Yep. What's interesting, and I, th- and I think this is where you're going, is that you, you've been talked about Steelhead being there year-round, you know, and, and like in, I think of Steelhead as a fall, winter, you know, there are some spring steelhead, I think, or summer steelhead around us, but um, it's just interesting that all these different regions kind of have just, like you said, have adapted in different ways. Like you go to British Columbia, they're the biggest steelhead in the world, you know, and then just, just south of them, you know, in the OP, like where you're at, they're just as big, but maybe not as big. Yeah. You know? And then yeah. As, as you come down the line, you know, we have these California steelhead that won't, don't like to be swung up. They don't like to chase a fly down like they do in British Columbia. Can you go into that a little bit and why, why this is? And yeah. So the first thing I want to hit on, and you guys hit on something, one reason they can, one reason that steelhead basically can inhabit that really big range from Kamchatka to Mexico, or, or I should say to be more specific is uh, the panhandle down there on Baja is that they're thermally really adaptable. So rainbow trout can survive in some of the warmest water temperatures of any salmonid and some of the coldest. So they're kind of like a generalist, right? Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. You know, sockeye and pink salmon and chum are too thermally restricted to live down in Baja, California, both in the ocean and fresh water. So it really comes down to steelhead two things. One is that, that, or three things. One is that they're really thermally tolerant Two is that they have lots and lots of different life histories. And three is they have a resident form, right? The trout. And that trout can keep a population of steelhead above water during periods when the ocean conditions are unfavorable. Mm. Um, so it's it's kind of everything, right? It's, it's really this three of the things. Now, we go back to why are steelhead big? Why, why is there this pattern right now geographically where we see the biggest steelhead up in places like the Skeena? And then as you move further into Alaska and you get out to the Aleutian chain where kind of the last steelhead populations exist, they're, they're back to not being really large again, right? Uh, but then you get to Russia and they've got very large fish again. Like you said, as you move down the coast in BC, it appears that they kind of decrease in size until you get back to around like the Skagit River, uh, mm-hmm. the Puget Sound and the Olympic Peninsula. And then you move further south, and there are some rivers in the Columbia that had really large fish, too, like, you know, um, the Clearwater with its bee runs. Mm -hmm. And also places like the Lewis River in um, the lower Columbia. I won't go into too many places, but you're right. There is this general pattern, except for a place like the Smith River and the Chetco, which do have some big fish, right, right? further, further down by you guys. But you're right. Generally, you all have smaller fish, and I cannot claim to know why this pattern exists but i want to take a couple guesses at it because this is the fun part of being an angler and a scientist right is we can we can guess a little bit um the first reason i think it exists is because it's a trajectory about human influence in other words the places where humans have been the longest the fish are the smallest Hmm. because we've over harvested the populations historically probably selected against large size And um, then we put dams in place, right, that limited the amount of habitat that the fish can reach, which probably eliminated um, different genotypes within the population. Um, So we're down to really altered populations. I want to give you an example, which is that when I was a boy and I would go back to the Clearwater River in Idaho and fish, which was known for its big bee runs, it was not uncommon to watch Steve Pettit or my father 
hear the stories about the big steelhead they would land or hook. And now you go back, you know, 30 years later, and it's really uh, the fish are thinner and they're getting smaller. Those bee runs are getting smaller in the Snake River. So that's a concern. But even though we think of those fish as big, I looked at data from scientists that went to the Columbia River to uh, sample fish that were being collected at, uh, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of the falls, Salilo Falls. And Salilo Falls around the Dalles, Oregon, and they sampled their steelhead in uh, September and October, and they got like several thousand fish. But the interesting thing is that they caught some steelhead that were really large, and the two biggest fish were both 38 pounds, but they were not even 48 inches, 40 inches in length. So we would normally say a 40 inch steelhead is about 20 pounds, but these fish again were 38 pounds and about 39 inches in length. Guppies. Guppies, <laughs> <Yeah>. exactly. <laughs> so you imagine there's no more, yeah, there's no more 38 pound steelhead in Idaho right now. And a state record from Washington came out of the East Fork Lewis River of like 32 to 34 pounds. And yet the East Fork is not known for its large fish anymore. So I think humans have played a role in that, right? We've killed a lot of those big fish because they were prized by us. And once you start killing lots of large individuals, it's really hard to produce a basketball team. Right? Yeah, there, there's that one there's that one Instagram post that you you're I think you're making this point and and you've got um it's the mountain. There's a picture of the mountain on the second on yeah. the second slide. Is that was that kind of like the 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 point you were trying to illustrate? Totally. It's, yeah. and it's that, you know, these big fish, big size really matters to salmon and steelhead and some species more than others. And so when you start eliminating genotypes that can produce big fish, then you limit your population. Now that said, I do believe that the largest fish seem to occur generally in the coldest climates. Yeah. Why or do the you coldest, think that is? Like glacier or the fit? Coldest, is that what you're talking yeah, about? I just mean geographically, like as you go far north, the Skeen is a cold place, Kamchatka is a cold place, you know, Puget Sound and the OP are relatively cold places. And then you've got Idaho, which is a pretty cold place. So the place that we have big fish remaining tend to be cold, but it's not ubiquitous because there's lots of streams in British Columbia that are equally as cold as the Skeena, but don't produce big steelhead, right? Well, an example of that is like the Smith River here in California. It's our last major undammed river, right? And so yes. it's not that cold, but because there's no dams, these fish had free range to go up and down, back and forth. And so that, that genetics has, has remained, right? That large fish yes. genetics. A absolutely. And I think one reason, so you know, these are just, gen we're trying to piece together patterns and kind of be like detectives, right? Mm -hmm. And figure out why something existed. So the reason existed historically might be different than now. Now I think that we're at, you know, fortunately we're catching releasing wild steelhead in a lot of the rivers. So we're probably not going to select to get size anymore. Uh, but I think fisheries probably had a big role as did dams. Um, but it's interesting why the Skeena would have such massive fish. And there's been a couple of a couple of hypotheses that people have generated. And w one is that um, the Skeena fish make really long migrations into very cold places. And when they migrate up into those really cold watersheds, they're gonna overwinter in habitat that might even be frozen over with ice. And fish need tremendous amounts of fat to get through those periods of time when they're not feeding. So one reason you might want to be bigger is so that you can put on more fat to overwinter without feeding at all um, in a really cold place. Now, the second reason that you might want to be really big is that there's some type of uh, competition amongst breeders, right? Some people, for example, or there might be some selection against smaller breeders. Like some people have theorized that you get large Chinooks, large Chinook salmon in rivers where you have lots of channel movement and bed scour. But that doesn't seem to hold up as much as what people are seeing in Chinook is that when you have really big males and uh, they're competing for females, that really big size of males can maybe drive a sexual competition, right? And that's kind of where the mountain comes in. Like if you've got an Arnold, and Arnold Schwarzenegger's a pretty big guy, he's like six foot, 210 pounds, and he was huge in the 80s, but then if somebody like the mountain comes along into your population, 
and the mountain is six nine, four hundred pounds, strongest man in the world. Well, he's gonna he's gonna be favored by a lot of those females, and he's gonna get to spread his genes throughout more females than Arnold would. So, introduction of large males and competition for females could also drive it. Um, but lastly, one reason might have been what we call a founder effect. And that is whoever the first fish were that started that population might have been big or they might have been small. Um, and that can have car carryover effects. So literally, I wish I knew why some were bigger than others, but I think it's a combination of all of those. Something about climate, something about competition, and then um, something about who, who started the population, whether it was a Danny DeVito and really small or, right. or whether but a really was, good personality. You know, yeah, exactly. Hey, you know, personality goes a long way. It right? Does. That's what they said on Pulp Fiction, right? You know, <laughs> exactly. I don't dig on swine. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> so I love that 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 scene. It's in the hallway, right? God, I oh, love man, that scene so much. I love that scene. And I love to draw upon this because so many of the evolutionary things that fish go through, we go through too. Yeah. And I find it easier to explain using metaphors like you did with the packets and data delivery and so yeah. I wish I knew why some fish were bigger, but I think it's some combo of all three. But literally, it's almost impossible to explain because you have a Smith River down there, right? That's producing big fish, and then right next door is the Klamath that produces tiny ones. Yeah. So, right, it's uh, hard to figure. Um, I I want to talk about that. I'm just like my mind's still spinning from that one and two uh, fish insight that you shared earlier. Um, yeah, how. Do, do those fit okay do those fish like imprint on a river as strongly as say a salmon would or well, that's a good, or do yeah. they do they bleed off and go to they may not necessarily ha have as strong of a draw to their natal system as, as say a salmon would you know that's a good question and we're dealing with that on the elwa because you know we're watching fish recolonize after dam removal yeah assuming that some of these fish are coming back from other places but what it looks like in steelhead is that their stray rates are not really high, and there's a couple of reasons for that amongst salmon in general. The first is salmon, uh, all salmon species get imprinted on the scent of the home water they're in, and that tends to occur in spring, um, winter some sometime leading into spring. So um, if you're a steelhead, you're going to spend – up where I live, two to three years in fresh water before you head to the ocean. So that gives you two to three years to imprint on your home water. Now, a fish down in your neck of the woods, a steelhead is more likely going to be a one or two-year-old smolt. So a one-year-old smolt would only have one year to imprint on those home waters. In contrast to other species, most Chinook, a lot of Chinook are zero-age migrants, right? They're moving out uh, at five to six months of age, and they might not even have a full year to imprint. And shit, they their... might be on the back of a truck too. That's right. They might be on the back of the truck. So one reason we think we tend to see higher stray rates is that the, the less time a fish spends in fresh water as a juvenile, the higher the stray rates tend to be. Okay. Um, but there's lots of variation in that, as you would guess, right? Yeah. And a lot of this is based off hatchery fish. So it makes it even more complicated. But Steelhead get imprinted like all salmon in freshwater, and then when they hit the ocean, there's some imprinting that go goes on with the magnetic fields. Oh, so so they're navigating in the open ocean like a GPS unit using the the poles. Holy and shit! The magnetic fields they use that to roughly guide them back to the the area you know near shore areas that are within probably tens of miles of their home water. And and, and that's, that go ahead, sorry. No, at that point, you know, it's nose in the air like a bird dog and just find your way home. You're so smelling. Basically, they're they're kind of like a homing pigeon and a dog that had a baby, but that baby had fins. Dude, that's perfect. Absolutely, and I love it. Because it a homing so... pigeon completely uses uh, polars, you know, po just magnetic fields to find its way around. Uh, that's perfect. I think you're absolutely right. And okay, I love so the comparison. Follow-up question. If – if a steelhead is sensitive to magnetic fields, is does a human being like near a, a particular waterway because we have we give off a little bit of uh, electrical field of some sort? Or so it's been, yeah. So it's been said. Do, can they pick up on that? You know, I don't know. It would be interesting though if we, if we 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 could 
perhaps screw with them with large magnets, right? At river mouths, I suppose. And you could probably influence what well, I'm, I'm joking, it, of course, but let yeah, us know. You, I know if we could figure out a way to <laughs> do that, drop I would a big, try and... <laughs> yeah, drop a big magnet through a pod and let us know what you see. <laughs> yeah. It's a great question. I mean, there's so much about that, that we just don't know. Like yeah. it's been relatively recently that scientists have actually been able to clearly say that this is happening and now we're trying to understand that's crazy why and how yeah when, yeah it is crazy when those when those one and two pair navy seal teams make it up into the river when we see them you know we don't see them in the river but or out in the ocean but we obviously see them out of drift boats and on the sides holding in 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 water um they tend to be potted up you know in in four yeah. or five six even bigger pods sometimes um is that simply because there's only so much holding water in the river and, and just by ma sheer math reasons, they're going to, they're going to hang out together. Is that why that we're seeing that? I think it is. And I, I think that once they get into fresh water, the otters love steelhead and oh. otters have otters have quickly learned that there's really one salmonid that's in fresh water almost every month of the year. And so we see lots of otter predation on steelhead. And so I think schooling up, um, helps them avoid otters. But I, I also think there's another reason, which is when I'm underwater, if you're just in a boat or walking along the bank, you tend to only notice those fish that are easily observable. But when I'm underwater, you do see a lot more singles, you know, oh, just okay. kind of okay. just as I snorkel through a river, there's kind of more singles out there than a person might expect. But especially in summer, summer fish tend to aggregate in those big schools. And winter steelhead don't do that as much. And I think it is because the flows are lower, the water is clearer, and they're more susceptible to predation. Makes sense. Totally makes sense. Yeah. I like what you were saying about the the imprinting too. I mean, if you go back to that episode, we talked about if a trout is a steelhead or steelhead is a trout, yeah. you know, you, you referenced a couple times that, um, you know, a female steelhead can make its way up some of these uh, feeder creeks to our main, main rivers, you know, these um, summer steelhead, or if you call them or whatever they are, and be by themselves, right? They're, they're lonely. But then there's a male trout that will sneak in and, and spawn with this female steelhead. And there's about a zero to 50% chance that that, that offspring is either going to be, uh, that's going to be a steelhead, right? Is that? Yeah, totally. It's, uh, in fact, the first mating event that I saw in the Elwha but with a, with a steelhead after the dams were removed, she was being courted by a five inch little male. And yeah. he was like, it was totally like you could envision a great Dane with a, a tiniest poodle or a little terrier. Right. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's hilarious to see, but it's, it's one of the things that makes steelhead so awesome. Too. But there's a hundred percent chance that the male that's out of the system is probably deployed in Iraq. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's totally right, man. Don't get me wrong. This, that, those ones that get the bone spurs and do not want to be deployed are the ones that are finding the steelhead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a feeling that you guys are going to like each other. I think you guys both grew up in the same, same time frame. That's awesome. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, geez, man, there's just so much stuff. So, uh, uh, wait, before we, before we go on another round of questioning, um, for the new folks that have just started listening to us and say the last three months, we have not covered the, the term B run before and the term stray rate. So can you kind of define those for us really quick before we push on? Yeah. A run I, I, and B run are the steelhead in Idaho. We've talked a little bit about it, but we have, but not recently. And yeah. just, we're picking new, new, yep. newbie, newbies up. A I lot think what's lately. interesting about those species is the height and elevation that they travel. I think yeah. You're it. right. It, it's amazing. I mean, so basically in the, in the snake river, we have, there's two runs of, they've broken down steelhead into two runs they call them a and B runs and a runs tend to come in earlier in the season and they tend to stay out in the ocean for only one. Uh, one year. So they're a one salt and the B runs on the other hand, tend to enter later in the season and they tend to spend two to three years in the salt. So they're much larger. Um, and stray rate just indicates the proportion of any given population. Like if you're talking about the American river or the Smith river, what pop, what proportion of those fish that go out to the ocean will not return back to their home river and will instead go somewhere else to another river. Yeah. And that's the stray rate. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, what's a, what I keep thinking about too is, you know, these Valley steelhead, the, the distance they have to travel kind of like that, those B run of steelhead that go up all the way into the middle fork uh, of the salmon. Um, the distance that these fish that have to go to, to get there is, is mind boggling. And, and it's funny cause 
some of the Valley steel that I've caught that are, you know, eight pounds wild, these wild eight pound steelhead have fought 10 times harder than this bright, you know, 12 pound Cromer that was on the coast that doesn't have to travel, travel as far. Um, what, what do you think about that? What it, you know, I, I see that same pattern. I mean, on the Olympic peninsula here, um, you know, every year I'm fortunate enough cause I live here to, to hook or land a couple of those monster steelhead and, and yet they really, you know, like you said, my coastal steelhead do not fight nearly as hard as those summer runs. And in general, my winter runs don't fight as hard as those inland summer runs. And I, I do think it comes down to, I wrote an article for Trout Unlimited's magazine and I called it decathletes to Danny's, which is that. Steelhead are remarkable, but I think our inland summer steelhead, those fish that travel long distance are basically like Dan O'Brien and the best of athletes in the world. Remember, I'm old enough to remember that Reebok had this big campaign where it was, was it Dave and Dave and Dan, Dan and Dave too old for most people on this podcast. Probably the point <laughs> is I think those fish that swim almost a thousand miles, hundreds of miles, those things have to be remarkable athletes, right? Really efficient. Right. Uh, probably have some physiological adaptations to swim that far and balance the fat loss. So I think you're right. You catch, you catch, you know, one of those fish and it's amazing. Um, you're just catching they, the endurance runner. It sounds like. Yeah, exactly. Um, but they're more than that, right? Because the endurance runner usually can't jump very high. And some of these steelhead are right. going to go over waterfalls that are 10 or 12 feet. I always go back to they're basically, I mean, you're right, but some of them are simply, you know, like, two mile, you know, two mile runners. Right. But they're amazing. And, uh, we don't know. We, we simply don't understand all the adaptations those fish have developed though, um, to make that possible. Does glacier fed versus rain fed have anything to do with this or turbidity? You know, that's a great question. Like we were, we were talking earlier about, you know, why do some fish bite a swung fly better than others? Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I do think I think this leads into that topic, which is I do think that uh, there's just very few glacial rivers in the interior. You know, a lot of our rivers do have a snowmelt runoff, but they don't have a glacier per se. Um, while our while our rivers out here on the coast, you know, like the Ho and the Queets, have glaciers in them. I don't know that glacier matters too much. Glacier uh, glacier influences the temperature uh, in some ways because of all the gravel, and of course, it's coming off a snowfield. Um, but man, to me, the hardest fighting fish have always been those interior summer runs that come out of those, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's the, the shoots or, you know, the click of tad, you get up into the, the snake river, you know, grand rond. And I'm sure you guys, like you're mentioning here, you know, for some reason, those fish are just simply better athletes. Right. Right. Uh, it kind of, it starts, you started making me think about, um, turbidity and, and, um, you know, the the steelhead and some, like the clear, the clear Creek or clear, you know, clear river over in Idaho and, you know, some of the other rivers and that are out there with glacier fed that, that run super turbid. Do you find that the, um, a, the bigger strains will be in those turbid rivers because they've just been protected for so many generations that that genetics has remained versus a river that's clear. And, and I, I see this both in, in both places, but it goes back to like being that detective and figuring it out. I know, but uh, just curious what your thoughts are on that. I, you know, it could be, I think, you know, our glacial rivers up here tend to run murky for long periods and anglers have long attributed our, our floods and that glacial turbidity to allowing some fish to escape the fishery and get upstream mm -hmm. before they're caught. But on our rivers up here, we also have pretty intensive commercial fisheries where about 30 to 40% of the run is harvested by gill nets. And, you know, it can be as turbid or, clear as you want. And they still seem to select really well, probably against larger fish. Right. Um, based on the evidence we have in other species. So I'm not sure why we have, I'm not sure if it is turbidity. Um, I do think turbidity limits angling impacts though. So I think you're right there. Like if, if the only pressure on that population are sportsmen, then I think that makes a big deal. And I, and I definitely think that could probably have impacted could be one reason why skein of steelhead have remained relatively large is that people have been catching, releasing them for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, just the attributes and features of the watershed make it prone to blowing out. So it's unfishable for extended periods. Right. 
Um, if you guys haven't, um, already done it, you should go check out, um, it's rainforest steel, right? That's your handle yeah. for, for yeah. Instagram. Rainforest underscore rainforest steel. underscore steel. Um, John is, uh, I, I don't even know if you can count how many hours you spent, um, you know, surveying and monitoring these fish from above and below water, but your snorkeling photos and, and all your shots and, and this kind of, I'm leading into this because of the clear versus tur- turbid water. You've, you've picked some really clear rivers to, to do some of your photography with, which is, which is awesome. And I'm sure just super time consuming and, and difficult. Talk, talk a little bit about, about that. Cause I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. I, you know, I realized that as a boy growing up, I got to fish all the time and my, my dad allowed that. But I, I begin to realize over time that, you know, I love catching fish, but sometimes you start sharing pictures with people of a fish you caught and they get kind of jealous because I'm fishing all the time and I, I don't, I don't <laughs> or, you know, or I'm, they think you just fuck off and don't do anything they else. Think, yeah. They think you're screwing around all day. Right. And I'm like, yeah. it's life choices, man. Right. I want to live in little communities out right near a river and I'll take less money to do that. So that's my priority. But I don't know. It must have been about 17 years ago when I was working with the Wild Salmon Center. I noticed that there was a guy named Thomas Dunklin, who I actually think is from down in your neck of the woods. And this guy had amazing underwater video at a conference I was at. And I saw that and was like, I've been snorkeling for a long time, but I didn't think, you know, I could afford anything like that to get that kind of footage. But um, the group I was working for helped me buy some. And, and so over the last 17 years, I've just kind of progressed from snorkeling to underwater video to now lots of photography and you have to be really careful about the rivers you select because as you say it's really hard to find one that's clear enough to get a good shot and then the fish have to actually remain really close to you right like a lot of the fish that i'm shooting they're about eight eight inches to a maximum of two feet away from the lens so like i'm right on them with a really wide angle lens and over the years, I used to just be in the water. Like I would, I would know where the steelhead rat and I would literally like belly crawl up the river to them a <laughs> hundred yards trying to like, and then you put the camera up there and you're stretching your hand out just to get the shot. And then they spook <laughs> and you're, and you're like, shit, are you serious? And I would be doing that day after day. So eventually I saved up money to get a remote system so I can put my camera out there in the river now where I know the fish is going to show up and then I can go back on shore with a tablet have and, you, uh, that's have, helped. Have you seen the, uh, the new underwater drones that are coming out? Like they've been out for a Dude. bit, but now the price is coming down to point where like, a, you know, average consumer can get one. Totally have. And those look awesome sick, too. And right? Sick, right? Like, I mean, what is so fun about being underwater is it takes away so many of the, uh, the mythos, the, you know, this kind of stuff, stuff that you think about in your head yeah. about fish. And when they're underwater, you're like, wow, they're not much different than my dog. Really? Like, <laughs> yeah. And, I, and, I, a, and I, a lot of, you know, a lot of, um, underwater data is lacking just because you know, it's a lot of, it, there's a big barrier to capture that kind of data. But as these, as the tools and technology gets a little more affordable and approachable, I think we're going to have like this flood of data and, and hopefully a whole nother, you know, um, I don't know, generation of, of insights to be gathered from this data, right? Oh, totally. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that's really awesome is to see the younger generation take hold of this technology and love to be outside. And so I think you're right. Like one of the challenges we face in conserving and doing really good research on steelhead is that not a lot of scientists, fish scientists spend a lot of time underwater with the fish or right? fishing or fishing. And so anglers have a lot of knowledge that scientists don't have. And on the other hand, scientists have some quantitative knowledge quite a bit that anglers don't have. But I think there's a blend there and there's a need for scientists to interact more with anglers because we're we're on the river so much. And there's a lot of insights that we can give them. And even if an angler might not have the right answer to the question, it's certainly going to create a lot of curiosity and I think make the scientist rethink some of their hypotheses so i i'm with you man yeah like a a, you know part of part of our business is kind of predicated on the on exactly what you're saying just the value of citizen science and there's definitely a role for it in in fisheries management huge i think it should be used more broadly like we use it a lot in in big game and and waterfowl hunting right like sir yep every survey every time you get a new license yeah yeah. 
Absolutely. And I think, you know, if you're out there and ducks are banded and people pay attention to that, and if you're getting checked at a station for your elk and somebody might tell you how old it was later on after they've gotten some data, but I, I think you're right. There's got to be closer, closer uh, coordination amongst is, the two groups. Is Thomas Dunklin, is it, I don't know how you, if you said that, if I said that right, is that the river snorkeler? Is he, is that who that is on Instagram? No. No, that's Russ Ricketts, and he's okay. a good guy too. Yeah, Russ. Russ is a good guy. Uh, I think. I think. I haven't seen. I haven't met Thomas in person since that first time I met him. Uh, but I definitely want to give his name a shout out because he was the inspiration for me to try and find a, a camera to get underwater. What when you um, when you first put on your your snorkel and your mask and you started swimming with these fish, what was the biggest misconception that you had before you started going underwater? really how how not afraid of you they are from above water all these fish clearly spook when we walk up to them right yeah but what but when you're underwater the juveniles especially in the trout sized fish are just really curious and so it was strange to have them swim right up to my mask and take a look and how many of them would feed out of my hands like you know take open a periwinkle and yank it out of its case speaking of which if if there is a if you know if if the, if the person guarding the pearly gates is a periwinkle, I'm likely going to hell because I peeled <laughs> off. <laughs> if it's a periwinkle guarding the gates, he's going to kick me out for sure. Because, <laughs> That's such a uh, funny, <laughs> it's so funny to visualize. <laughs> I know. I was, I was 11 when I got my first mask and we lived on a river and I go out, outside, you know, it's an 85 degree July day. What are you going to do? I'm going to sit in the water and circle during the day and I'll go fish in the evenings and mornings and, I was out there peeling periwinkles all the time. So one, the juveniles and small fish are not that spooked. And then two is I was shocked to learn about these fish that I call the ostrich, right? The ones that are adults that go hide their head under rocks and think they can't be seen. Um, but they're too large to effectively hide themselves. I, saw, I think I have. Oh, I saw you talking about that on, on Instagram. And um, I think you even, you grabbed one by the tail and pulled it out and quickly handled it. And it, it, maybe tell that story real quick. <laughs> Yeah. So one of the things that I didn't realize was that juvenile fish, and I didn't know this as a boy, but juvenile salmon in winter, especially when temperatures get cold, they become nocturnal. They spend a lot of their daytime activity hiding down in the rocks, right? That's a safe place. So hiding in rocks is something that juveniles do. And it took me several years to learn that's something that adult steelhead tried to do. So it's not uncommon when I'm circling down a river to have a steelhead peel off and and dart away and then come up, you know, 10 yards down the river. And there's a tail sticking out of the rocks, which is a steelhead that's got his head buried in boulders. And there his tail is. And it's like an ostrich because its head is hidden. It must logically therefore think that I am hidden and it cannot see me. <laughs> and it, it's, but do, you know, <laughs> is it, is it doing it, um, for predation or, or to conserve it is. calories? Predator. I think it's yeah. predation, yeah. Pred, uh, predator avoidance behavior. And so, you know, there's been times when I go up and I think I have a video of me tickling the the tail on one, right? They really don't care. They're just hiding. But in the, in the, in the one case, uh, we were working in the Ho River and we're surveying an upper tributary in the river. And I told my friend a few days before who I'd surveyed with, who was my colleague, and he would, I would snorkel through and count all the fish. And then I would get up and tell him the numbers. And he would use a laser rangefinder to measure all the habitat features. And we were about a mile into the survey, but I told him about a few days before that I think I'm going to catch a steelhead because a lot of these fish are trying to hide in here and I can just grab one by the tail. And so sure enough, we're snorkeling down the river and hiding in this log jam is a really big steelhead. So I reach back and grab its tail, pull it out and just lift it out of the water. And this is 1999. So folks, forgive me. It's, you know, 20 years ago. And I don't, I wouldn't suggest this people grabbing fish and holding them up. But nonetheless, I was 25 years old, completely excited. And I hold up like a 15 pound crow buck to my friend who's on bank collecting the data. And he's like, holy shit. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I cut a seal head without gear, right? Just my hands. And I put it back in the water and uh, let it go. And there's been a couple times, you know, where it's just uh, where you see that, you know, every summer there's a couple times or winter where I'm snorkeling along and a fish try and hide, tries to hide and its tail's completely sticking out. And in the uppermost part of our rivers, a lot of the summer runs are uh, have the dorsal fins and the tails are all tattered up from the otters trying to pull them out from their hiding spots. 
So the otters are like ripping yeah. on the tail. That was going to be trying my next to get question, these things out. We've yeah. seen that. We've seen that on the river. Um, yeah. Okay. You that, do. That, okay. That explains that. Okay. Um, do you do you guys get a lot of lampreys up there? Do you see a lot of lamprey marks on on steelhead? Almost none on steelhead, although I see lamprey spawning uh, in the river, but I don't really see many lamprey marks on steelhead. Do you guys? Um, depends where we're at. Not not here, but on the um, out by Michigan, you see a lot of that going yeah. on um, with those fish. Yeah. How much? So when you're going out and snorkeling for these fish, do you get out, get your rod out after you're done and fish through that run? Is more of your time spent snorkeling versus fishing now? Good, good question. And so initially, yes. Like when I first started snorkeling as a kid, when I was 11, I would go through all the river behind my house daily to figure out where they steelhead were sitting. And I'd go fish for them. I took it even a step further once I got to 13, which is that we had two shallow runs behind my house. And my dad said they were no good for steelhead. I didn't have a car being 13. I went down and started removing big boulders out of these pools and creating habitat. holding areas yeah i created i created freaking holding habitat so the ripples went from a consistent three feet to having five foot deep pockets every 10 feet but and man, I woke how, up the, that's so important for you just like to to learn yeah. that right to to, to, under, it, to make to, that connection that, that, that that's that, how you can do that you know like you you yeah okay that's really interesting because that's like a little that's like a little micro case study for the california valley <laughs> and, it, and it and it it worked, and I was down there three days later after a rainstorm, and I think the next morning I rose one, but it was a couple days later we got a rainstorm, and I, I hooked like eight in there. And So my dad eventually had heard about all this from me, of course. I was pretty excited, and then I caught him down there, the bastard, one day fishing in water that he had told me was horrible, and then I had spent weeks constructing right it, these beautiful it? steelhead holding areas. So this is, this, this is like an important question because how quickly – did those steelhead move into that new habitat? Because we've talked about this before. Like we've we've wondered, you know, how long does it once once a restoration project happens? Um, how long does the uh, you know the, the species that you're trying to support uh, actually take take uh, root in that ha- that new habitat? I mean, it was within a day. You know, yeah. we had a big pool below those two riffles, and they used to just scoot through in low water and not hold. But yeah, the next day, and uh, so. Over the next few summers, I did that every summer. And we're talking 1983 to 86. That's awesome. It was a long time ago. And and certainly people probably wouldn't want to do that nowadays. But yeah, it was was awesome to learn about. So snorkeling wise now, like I don't go back and fish after I snorkel because I'm 48 years old and I've caught. Yeah, you know, that's not, I'm in a different period in life, but I wouldn't begrudge people, you know, from doing that. I mean- it's, we're human. Are you are you telling us that and, it's too easy and you like to make steelheading hard on yourself? Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say that it's too easy because we've all been through those yeah. weeks, you know, you know how it goes. But I felt like uh I felt like my interest in when, once I knew they were there, it, the the excitement of not knowing, right? Like yeah, I yeah. enjoyed the feeling of not knowing. You know, it's a roll of the dice with steelhead. So uh, most of the time now, what I do is after I snorkel, I know where they're at. Then I go back and try and get photos. I, I think um, it opens your mind to that creative world that you don't get a chance to see very often, you know, and experience. Yeah. And, and then once you've kind of got a, a piece of that, you're just like, okay, I, I know I see that submerged rock. I know that there's a fish sitting right in front or behind it. Right. Yeah. Um, when, um, so, you had, so you had this, this, this little stretch of river right behind your house and you, and you basically dissected it. In fact, terraformed it. Um, <laughs> when, so awesome. when, my questions around this, like if you, if you're targeting steelhead or any species for that matter, and you really understand a section of, of river, right? Like we have, we have uh Puta Creek that, that runs, it's just North of the Bay area, gets a lot of people from, from the Bay there. If, if you kind of like understand the the mechanics of how that a system system X works and you know it really well, can that knowledge, how much of that knowledge transfers basically to any, any system you go into? A, a lot of it is transferable. You know, I'm going to guess seven, 70%, 80% is really kind of across watersheds. And then you've got this 10 to 20% that is, and this is a guess, right. That is kind of unique to each place. Like I'll give you an example mm-hmm. 
the first time I went to the Dean River to fish, everybody had told me about how those fish like to sit in really shallow, like one foot to two foot deep water right next to shore. Hmm. Even though it's this really large river at like 4,000 CFS. And I've seen that behavior in some of our glacial rivers up here, but it's pretty uncommon. And sure enough, one week experience on the Dean highlighted to me that those steelhead were commonly holding in a foot or two foot of water. And that's not something that I see a lot down here. And uh, so sometimes each watershed's a little different, you know, in terms of how fish respond. I ultimately, I think one of the big factors, though, is just how many humans you have on that river in terms of boat traffic and people fishing. Because the rivers that I see that have the most boat traffic and the most anglers, after that initial pulse of high water you get, you know, those rivers, the fish tend to seem to go hide more more frequently, remain on bottom more frequently. Um, and I, I think that impacts, uh, their behavior is just, yeah. What you know, about I, seals, I a, seals, and yeah, seals for sure. Otters, you know, I mean, I've seen seals a few miles up our rivers. Uh, it seems to me on the rivers that I'm familiar with, it's mo most of the seals are taking them right at that saltwater interface. Right. Uh, but, but of course, once you get down to the Columbia, you know, they're being caught in freshwater a long ways from the salt. But yeah, I think, you know, their response to any predator is pretty common, right? Kind of sink down to the bottom and uh, hide and then kind of wait for that threat to pass. Hmm. What's it, So what's the temperature of the water you're snorkeling? Well, usually I, I prefer summer when it's in the mid 60s, even low 70s, right? That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I don't need much other than, you know, a thin wetsuit. But winter, it's not uncommon for me to be in the 40s. And, uh, um, thick is your wetsuit, you know, the wetsuits a five, five millimeter. Mm -hmm. Um, but in, when it gets down into the forties, I wear a dry suit. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I just pack on a, a nice, whatever you would wear waiting mm -hmm. and multiply it by two and put it on your body <laughs> and, and crawl in it. And what sucks is the dry suit, you stay really afloat because it's a dry suit. So you're buoyant like a damn bobber and you have to put on then a weight belt to get underwater. So I hate dry suits because it means not only do I have to carry my camera and all that crap, but then I have to pack along weight and that stupid dry suit. So I love wetsuits, man, but dry suits suck and you, it's no fun to be in water. Do you recommend uh, going with a friend or a buddy if you're going to do something like this? A absolutely. Like I, if you, if you're interested in snorkeling and I would suggest everybody spend 30 bucks on a mask and snorkel and go out in the summertime into a small river or creek, take your friend, have somebody there that can watch and just stick your head underwater. You'll be amazed at what you, at what you see and, and how much you kind of learn immediately. It's like pulling back the curtains on that, that movie, that Jim Carrey movie, right? Where he was actually in a, in a big the television Tr show. show. Yeah. 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 It's, it's kind of like that. I was just shocked when I first got underwater and every time I have new people get underwater, they can't stop talking for like an hour about, you know, all the stuff they saw. So, but definitely be careful because it can be dangerous, you know, and have a yeah. friend and, um, uh, choose warmer water and choose smaller places initially. I think this is a, a good lead into, um, one of the things that you've done and, and that was documenting, you know, over 500 steelhead hooked between Vancouver Island, the Kalawa and the Siletz. Is that correct? Yeah. Siletz. Yeah. And, yeah. And you broke it down to a, a catch per unit effort, CPUE. And you, you talk about, you know, temperature of the water, depth of the water, the lighting and, and all these different variables. And then how, you know, what the reaction was, well, how many steelhead you caught versus with all those different variables. Can, can we, let's talk, can we talk about that? And you might not have the data in your, one, in your head, but one I think props it's, for catching 500 steelhead. <laughs> <laughs> I've only got 490 no. to go. To catch up to you. Yeah. <laughs> No, totally. I think this is a good one. If people are interested, it's on my it's on my Instagram page where I have the the kind of data for everybody to look at. But we'll post you know, my, it. We'll my, post it in some show notes too. Or cool. on our on our end too. Yeah, because I probably won't be able to remember all of it offhand. But you're right. So from the mid '80s through like the mid 2000s, um, I just took I you know I've I've been steelheading like I said for a, a big part of my life, and I was fortunate in the mid eighties to be up on Vancouver Island in years when we had the best ocean survival on record, you know, like the 19 mid 1980s from like 84 to 87, even on the Washougal and the Columbia where I grew up, 
and probably down where you guys were at too, the ocean survival was just incredibly crazy. So I had a lot of fish and you can imagine that in the mid eighties, there were not nearly as many people fishing for steelhead. So I got the opportunity to experiment, you know, with steelhead in a way that a lot of folks didn't. And so what I would do is go out there and I would try a dry fly, you know, a waking fly. Right. And then I would try a wet fly and then I would try different variations on how I would swing that wet fly across the water, uh, the size of the fly. And I would try variations in how I waked my fly. Like, was it dead drifted? Was it skating just straight across or did I, you know, let the fly swing downstream in a big circle? And I collected information like water temperature, water clarity, time of day, angling pressure. Basically, I had a lot of free time. So I collected a lot of information <laughs> and I got that intuition from reading books as a kid. Like I'd read Ryder Keg Brown's book and he collected this type of information. I remember reading Herzog's book on spoons and information that he collected on that. And then I watched my dad collect it. So it was it was just informative to help me figure out, do all of these, you know, there's a number of dogmas that we have in steelheading, right? Like, do they hold true? And in most cases, those dogmas appear, at least on my work, to be based mostly on, on fact, things that I was able to observe. But of course, there are things that you wouldn't think about. Like, um, what I find is that some of my most successful waking fly fishing when flows get really low is that I focus on very shallow pocket water. Like in the Washougal growing up as a boy, and even on the Silettes, when I was in grad school, I was probably catching half my steelhead in water where the, the you have a boulder and the boulder would be in the middle of a riffle or a rapid and it would create a turbulent pocket behind it, you know, like a bubble curtain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the water in there is like a foot or two deep, but that's where I was catching most of my steelhead um, and still do in the summer or not most, but, but about half. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of anglers probably walk by those shallow pockets when fishing during the summer months. Right. Uh, but it's just that fish are always doing things that you might not think they would do unless you're underwater taking a look at them all the time. Um, uh, I don't know if there's any details you want to go into on that. It's probably easier for folks to look at. Right. Right. The, the yeah um well i did have i did have kind of like a follow-up question based on what nick was saying um and it's really around instagram if, if you kind of like look at your instagram as a whole it looks like at some point like roughly midway through your posting you'd really decided to put uh a lot of like infographics and things like that to kind of support your photos and then you know unlike a lot of instagram posts that are basically just you know self-serving uh, copy to support whatever the post is and hashtags and everything, every single thing that you post, there's, there's a nugget of truth and value there that really is like in a lot of ways, mind blowing when you, when you follow your stuff. So I know we've already said your, 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 uh, Instagram a few times, but you guys absolutely need to listen or follow him. But what made you kind of like decide editorially to switch to that more metrics kind of driven approach, like roughly halfway through? Yeah, that's a good point and good observation. You know, I was I was at a conference and I was giving the talk where I talk about the difference between the mountain and Danny DeVito. And actually, right. I was using P Peter Dinklage because I love Game of Thrones. So oh, I was yeah, like, was well, great. well, up until yeah, the last season, which was total dog. I shit, know but... total dog shit. Right. <laughs> yes. That was a horrible season. And uh, yeah, but I, I love the movie and I think it provide you know, that TV show. And so when I was at this co conference, giving a talk, somebody's like, there's so many people that are never going to get to see this. Yeah. And I thought to myself, you're right. And so I just decided to throw one of the whole presentations up slide by slide and walk people through it. And it seemed like it got a, a lot of positive feedback. And Absolutely. so I figured people and the more, the more I meet with the younger generation, the more they're interested in science and kind of consuming information to learn more. And so, man, Instagram has been great for me. You know, yeah. I, I, I feel like it's an awesome way to interact. And if I can give people some information, um, and then they can f give me feedback because there's been things I've learned from, from folks on Instagram too. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I might present something. They come back with a counter. Like I see this or I've seen this. I'm like, Oh my yeah. God, that's really cool. Share it with me. Yeah. Instagram's like a, you know, a hammer. You can, you can drive a nail with it or you can put the, uh, the back part of it through somebody's skull and do some serious damage. So <laughs> it just kind of depends on how you wield it. I have, I, I, I have, think, go ahead. 
No, I was going to say you're right. You know, I'm 48. I'm Generation X. And I looked at my friends that are on Facebook and it was just one mass of people getting pissy and Internet warriors. And yeah. I was like, Instagram seemed friendlier, more cordial. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, ha- I have a, a combat to, do, to deal with it, uh, you and what you, uh, something you mentioned. You, you said that the large males kind of lead lead the pack. Yeah, yeah. And and I've observed kind of the opposite, but this is only in like the trout world, you know, in some of our streams and and you know, not just species, but or just specific species like striper and trout that I've noticed will do this and that's the bigger ones kind of hang out behind in like the tail outs uh, of the run and kind of watch over their, you know, their posse a little bit. So I was cool. I was confused by that a little bit, but go talk about that maybe because I streamy well, run. No, I think that's awesome. In fact, I think what you are seeing is true. And I would say, say that my observation w- was the same from above water too. You know, like when I'm looking at schools of fish or, or fish that are together, I think you're right. It's the biggest male that's often at the back, mm-hmm. right? Kind of hanging out. Like right. I'll let everybody else get killed or <laughs> deal with it. You know, I'm <laughs> right. back here. And, and for winter steelhead, where I live on the Olympic Peninsula, I think there's a number adv- another advantage for steelhead sitting in the tail out of these big pools and runs is that they get the first look at whoever is moving into the pool, right? So they're kind of like the bouncer at the door of the club. If there's a big hot girl that goes by and that's who they want to breed with, they get the first chance at her. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, but and, – and these are just – like literally I'm anthropomorphizing, right? I don't know the reason that these fish do that. Their right. brain's the size of a, <laughs> right. you know, peanut. And so you're trying to guess, but so. I think when it comes right. to sex, fish and uh, the motivations of man and the motivations of fish are probably pretty frigging similar. I think you're right, man. I don't think there's a whole lot of difference, yeah. right? You yeah. know, it's, it's the same, it's the same, you know, sex is so important. It feels so good to everybody universally that I think that it's just, it's driving so much of these behaviors. And, uh, but you know, you're talking about, so when I'm underwater and when I see fish make a decision to move from a predator or make a decision to move up a stream in those cases for steelhead only, I tend to see. 60, 70% of the time, the biggest male to make the first initial shot at making that happen. That makes sense. So, Interesting. so micro, micro movements, right? You know, like if you have, like when I'm snorkeling and I go in and all the other steelhead, a lot of times will sit below me and it'll be, um, a couple of the smaller fish will move up to take the initial risk, but it's, they won't fully come up in a school and be comfortable with me until that big male is with them. Interesting. So I think he he provides them a sense of safety, but I think you're right. In general, those fish aren't like leading the pack per se. They're they're kind of hiding somewhere within the pack because I think they are really obvious because they're so much larger. Mm-hmm. You know, it must be like you're a sixth grader and you're six foot tall, and everybody looks at you, and that's awesome. Yeah. By the time you're twenty and everybody catches up, when you're a sixth grader and you're six foot, it probably sucks. So so don't be bullying kids in eighth grade. That's right. Don't be the bully yeah. because you never know who's going to come so, back and be the big one later. John, John, about 10 minutes ago, you said something about um, 80s runs being, you know, the populations were much higher than they are now. Yeah. And I want to kind of like, it got me thinking about, okay, well, what's changed between the 80s and, and now? Um, you know, in, in the systems that you're that you're drawing your, your observations from, were there are there now dams that weren't there? It's kind of, um, what's the, is there, is it, is everything a constant or what's, what's been different? I'm trying to figure out like what's been different that would cause a, a decline like that. You know, you know, and before you answer, it's pretty cool that you go to British Columbia and you, you get a fishing license and they'll send you the data for the last 20 years, what the steelhead counts were, right? They have like an mm-hmm. overall steelhead count and you, it's just like the stock market. It's going up and down and up and down, mm-hmm. but I'm curious to hear his, his answer. And I think, it, I think that's neat that they do that. I wish there yeah. was more, more of, up more there. up. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I think it's awesome. Like I think British Columbia does a really good job of, you know, sharing that information, right. right with anglers. Mm-hmm. It's, it's important. So, um, I don't think, I think that the, you know, I grew up in the Columbia River Gorge on the Washugal River, and nothing has remained stacked. As you would guess, you know, the environment's probably more degraded now than it was when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, but something happened, and nobody's quite sure, because it just happened in the ocean. It's like a convergence of amazing conditions. 
So it must have been a combination of really good upwelling. Maybe there was some atmospheric issue that had happened over, played out over a period of uh, years or decades. But something happened there in the mid 80s. And in some places, they were seeing a smolt survival that was 15 to 30 percent. Well, I mean, we're is, that, talking, is that high or low? High, super that's high. really high. Really like high. you're okay. Yeah, in a lot of places down where you're at, you're probably getting 2%. 2 to 3%. Yeah, yeah okay. and that's good. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So some places had 30% smolt to adult survival. And I remember, so, you know, every now and then there's just a convergence of ocean conditions that make things really remarkable. And those things come out of nowhere to surprise you. We had another series of runs like that in the early 2000s up here on the Olympic Peninsula. Yeah, and, I guess uh, I guess what I'm, the root of my question is there, is there, any, any kind of like man created issues between the eighties and the night and, and the present that you guys feel, um, is, con is, is a large contributor, i.e. um, commercial fishing, for example. I don't, I don't think so for steelhead. It seems to me like there was just a massive run there, um, for a few years and I felt lucky to live, live through it and other yeah. kids, you know, we had it in the early 2000s again, though, just not as good, not quite as good. So I would say this, that it's unlikely we're ever going to have that type of abundance again unless things really change. Because it seems like as we go on, the peaks get lower and the troughs get deeper I, I in, the, in, the, in the abundance of steelhead. So, you know, it's hard to say, man, what caused all of that. I just really absolutely don't know because that's um i don't know that folks have answered it yet fully what happened yeah, yeah. in those that five-year period um i've there's so many so much shit i want to talk to you about man i feel like you might have to be invited back on an on another episode or are we doing it on the no. water or are we doing it on the water with them <laughs> to, yeah to that'd be awesome i can summarize real quick i just want it because some of the listeners i'm sure are freaking out they're like oh, what, what's the what did it what were his findings and so basically temperature best between 53 and 62 degrees now this is swinging flies on the surface right so temperature best between 53 and 62 i think depth was like three to five feet light was early in the morning obviously late in the evening right makes sense i mean if, if you're an angler you kind of always want to when you're swinging um or skating flies i mean low light is the best I, I, obviously fish don't have eyelids you know they can't they, that sun's bright so um and then pressure of anglers obviously the the less pressure the more active those fish were and, and the ones that bit the most Cool. Um, so oh. that's just summarize of his CPU E. Okay. And I want to talk about this, the hatchery stuff. There's that one, po that one post in particular. That mm -hmm. says, yes. Bonk them all. I was actually kind of surprised that was on your feed, but then you explained it before the show why that's on your feed. And I want to like education, educate us on why you feel like, um, you know, bonking a hatchery fish. Uh, taking it out of the gene, the gene pool, so to speak, is, is a good thing. Yeah. And this is a great question because usually on my page, I don't take too many stances, right? I'm just trying to give folks some information to let them make their decision. And, um, but in this case, somebody reached out to me and they're like, Oh, we've got these cool shirts. And one of them is, I can't remember what it even says. On. I've got it in my closet in there, but whack, whack every steelhead you catch, whack every hatchery fish you catch. And so the reason that's important for us where I live, and there are caveats to this. And I'm like, you, I'm like that you prefaced it where I live. Where I live in, um, where I live and up here kind of in the Columbia River Basin North, we have issues where we have large returns of hatchery fish that are coming back to the systems. And the more of those fish that survive the fishery and escape to spawn with wild fish, the worse off the wild fish will be because these are what we call segregated hatchery programs, Right. In other words, every year they're just breeding hatchery fish over and over again, and they're not, they don't survive in the wild very well at all. Yeah. Survival rates are around 15 to 30%. So we, we don't want those fish spawning with wild fish, but you want them there so you can catch them. Now, if there's been um, an increasing frequency of people not retaining hatchery fish in places like the Columbia over the past decade or so, and one reason is because there's been an increase in fly anglers, and fly anglers are often reluctant, for whatever reason, to kill those hatchery fish. And our, my argument is that if you don't kill them and take them home, which is your responsibility, that that will increase the number of those fish that are on the spawning grounds. 
And the more hatchery fish on the spawning grounds, the more likely managers are to reduce the number of steelhead that are being planted. Less because they capacity. Have, that's right. They've got policy obligations, right? We can plant this many fish, but you've also got to kill a pile because we don't want them on the spawning grounds. So when you have hatcheries that are segregated and they're not meant to help the wild population at all, my stance is whack the sucker. It's your responsibility and it's great food. And frankly, we're anglers and people need to learn how to kill animals, right? I mean, this is a blood sport. There's nothing wrong uh, with killing an animal humanely. On the other hand, there are populations where you're using hatchery fish to re rebuild the population. And like uh, one of our, one of my colleagues at Trout Unlimited lives on the Carmel River and they're mm -hmm. using broodstock there. And you don't want to go kill Carmel hatchery steelhead, right? They've got like a couple of wild ones left. So I'm glad you raised this. There is a distinction. If you have a program, a hatchery program that's being used to try and sustain or rebuild your wild fish, do not kill those fish. Yeah. And, and I think that's indicative of, of a lot of the hatchery programs in, in California. So I think this is a, <clears throat> this leads into the next thing I want to talk about. And, uh, it, it's, it comes close to a lot of guys heart and soul and passion for this sport. And it's, uh, the keep them wet movement. Um, and you know, and I saw that you're, you're a big advocate for that. And I, I want to play the devil's advocate here and mm. come out with a different angle. And so I want your, good movie too, I want your response, your response. Sure. Cause when I, I think of steelhead and we, we talked, we've been talking about steelhead and how resilient they are. Um, you know, and, and all these different environments, you know, you're talking about steelhead jumping 10 to 12 feet in the air, you know, up a waterfall. Um, I've seen personally steelhead, you know, in, in like an inch of water hydroplaning across the, yeah. across the surface of the water, you know, and you're just like, oh my gosh, how did that fish, you know, not beach himself and get back into the main stem of the river? You know, there's all these things that, that I'm sure anglers have seen and, you know, and, um, there's this huge movement to keep, keep these steelhead wet, keep them in the water. Don't bring them out of the water. Just, and, and it's proven by science that it just helps their survival rate. But then you go back and think about guys that fish bait, guys that fish bar, you know, barbs, guys, you know, all, all these different <laughs> angling perspectives yeah. that are going against it, you know, like why, why is it so important to keep them wet? I mean, when we have all these guys bonking hatchery steelhead, you know, using bait to catch fish, wh why does it matter? Why, why is this so important? You know, I think that's a great question. And, and frankly, I would say that I've kind of fallen in the middle of this argument. You know, I'm on the keep them wet um, sign ambassador board um they're going through some changes in the the main reason i got on it was like i'm not going to try and judge somebody for holding the fish out of water um but it was more or less just another out uh avenue to you know communicate with anglers and mm -hmm. i think you're right you hit on one aspect which is steelhead are going through a pile of stuff and if you remove them out of the water for five to six seconds it's probably not going to do much harm to the thing right i mean and the hardest thing about all of the, let me be clear on the science. The hardest thing about the science is, is I'm still not sure that the science indicates that there are any long-term negative effects to the steelhead's ability to reproduce if right. you remove it from the water. Right. There's work on Atlantic salmon that suggests that, um, but you're still you're still letting the science play out, right? So to me, it's not crystal clear. I've also had people tell me that like. Like for me, I fish alone. I'm going to, I'm going to dive into this a little bit. Okay. Because I think it's a great topic. So yeah, yeah. I still had fish alone, like 99% of the time. And that means any fish that I want to take a photo of that I catch, I have to bring it into that five to six inches of water, take the hook out and then let it sit there. And I get out my camera and if it leaves and swims away, no big deal. But sometimes it'll stay there for the shot. Right. Yeah. It's a great way and to I've land had people. Fish. Sorry. Uh, yeah. And I've had people, no, I've had people, you know, rip into me on Instagram and say that fish, you've just killed it. That's really harmful. You brought it in and let it sit on, on the rocks in the shallows. And I respond to them and say, just like you've told me, I've watched steelhead try and jump 15 foot falls and crack their head falling down these falls, you know, 20 times a day. They're tough fish, right? Lying them on five inches of water on their side is not going to do any harm to them as least as I can tell. And plus, a lot of the fish that I catch, I'm out there snorkeling too, right? So I can go back out there and snorkel day after day. And if I was seeing mortality, I would, if I was killing the fish from doing that, I'd likely see the mortality. So in one sense, I really do agree. Like, I think these are small things in the overall scheme of 
saving steelhead, right? Yeah. Yeah. But in the bigger picture, what I the real reason I like keep them wet is that I'm just trying to keep anglers aware that there are little things that we can do that make the fish's life easier. And I again talk about most of this comes from the places where I live. So on the Olympic Peninsula in 2014, the Department of Fish and Wildlife estimated that we caught anglers caught caught and released every steelhead in the Ho River 1.4 times on average. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. So I again go back to my areas, right, guys? Like I'm not gonna, you know, I don't like broad blanket applications all the time, and I don't see a huge problem with keeping the fish wet, but I don't also have a huge problem with a guy lifting the fish out of the water who knows what he's doing, you know? Yeah, so right. you just hit the nail on the but, head. That that experience is definitely helpful in that situation. It, experience matters and you know how many of your fish are being caught matters if all our fish up here being caught one and a half times then i'm much more concerned about keep them wet than i am in a place where they're not yeah. being caught one point one point yeah. five or two times and there's other issues like i see people now that i had a guy reach out and and people a lot of fly fishermen prefer to just grab the leader right and tail the fish out in the middle of the current mm -hmm. but every time i try and do that and i've been doing this for a long time you know half those fish just go shooting back out to the main current again, right? And then you're stuck trying to kind of lasso the fish back and forth again. So I don't know that there's a perfect way, but I'm with you guys in that I support that, but I don't think it's the, can the straw that's going to break their back. And it and whether people should be practicing that to the, to the nth degree depends on the population they're fishing. Yeah, it's a good answer. Yeah, I, like I mean, it. I mean, some of the, I could argue the, the, the reasons – to put put photos on Instagram, which I'll try and do now. Um, one, uh, just from a you know activating new anglers, getting getting new new anglers interested in the sport, I think is important in terms of just you know driving manpower. Yeah, manpower to to power, yeah. you know to drive conservation efforts. Right, we need we need boots on the ground and brains. Um, the other thing is like if you're a new angler and you follow some of your you know you you Instagram stock some of your favorite anglers. The one thing that they all have in common, a lot of these fish photos, the, the hero shots you're seeing is actually how they're, how they're managing the fish, whether they're, how they're holding that fish, how they're composing the photo, that kind of stuff, like watch for, watch and, and really just study one of those photos to see what you're doing, what they're doing. And I guarantee you, if you look at your top 10 anglers that you follow on Instagram, very similar, how they, how they deal, handle their fish. So in terms of getting best practices by osmosis, when it comes to fish handling, that's another reason I, I actually am a proponent of uh, taking fish out of the water and getting shots. Yeah, if you look at like uh, guys like Deck Hogan or Lonnie Waller, uh, some of these guys, I mean, they fished for years and probably yourself with never without ever picking up a net, you know, catching some, oh, of, some of the most powerful fish you've ever landed in your yeah. life without using a net, you know, and that, and that's it's cool. It's like the dance, you know, it's part of like catching the fish and going after Absolutely. the fish in the first place. It's like a, it's kind of like a dance to me. And I, I, I definitely enjoy yeah. it. And I, I, I always compete with myself to, to be able to handle that fish the quickest possible and get it right back in the water yeah. without, like, without anything going yeah, by. I, you know? I think the more experienced the angler, the less yeah. likely they are to need that social proof to valid, you know, to, for them to like validate their skill sets advancing because they just kind of know but i mean i i don't take near as many fish photos as, as i did when i first started in fact i mean I, i've been i've been dm'd on facebook when i first started hey you need to not like post every single picture of fish you take and i i'm dude i get it though when you're brand new to the sport you're just excited you're catching a fucking fish and you want to tell the world about it right it's just like totally. anything else so um, I think as an angler progresses, gets better with the, the fish handling and all that, it just kind of comes natural that you take less photos. But social media does play a very vital role in growing the sport. And, and a lot of people, um, you know, poo-poo the practice of putting photos up. Um, but there's, there's definitely a role to play there. And it's an important role. Um, but there's also a downside to it. And I think that kind of plays out it's on, on Instagram as well. So... You know? Yeah, I think you're right. You know, I mean, I, I always try to let people know that I, you know, my dad helped get catch and release implemented on two rivers in our house on wild steelhead in 1984, I think it was. And wow, man, soon after that, we got rocks through the windows. Oh, and, sure. You know, I got, I, 
you know, I got in fist fights with my friends at school, right? Because their dads wanted to kill fish and, and you go through that. And what you always want to remind people is that, man, change is hard, but inevitably you look back on it. You're like, it wasn't really that bad. And in this case, yeah. I just, I just think that really, I don't like the, all the argue, you know what I mean? One reason this rule was important in Washington is that a lot of people on the OP were just simply bringing their big steelhead into the bottom of the drift boat and letting them flop around for 40 seconds before they let them go. Jeez. So that's the behavior we're trying to get against. We're not worried about the guy who lifts the fish out of the water for a five seconds for a picture, right? Ooh. I was worried about the most egregious behavior, which was dragging it into the drift boat, letting it flop, and yeah. then or up or sky high up, up on bank, 10 yards up on well, bank. That, right? that's, an, that's very important to understand the origins of this movement. Is that's that's basically yeah. what you're implying, right? It's it was it's totally really to, okay. So that's it wasn't important. about this extreme kind of nitpicky, yes. right? It was yes. literally about really egregious behavior. And let's deal with that. That was what I saw as the origins of this rule in Washington and the movement kind of came out from that rule. Interesting. Dude, you've taught me so much today. <laughs> I feel like I should send you money. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, you know, scientists don't make that much money for all we go to school, man. It's a, it's a really shitty return on an investment at the end of the day. Yeah. It, I mean, it sounds like you've been on this path since you were a little kid though. It's pretty cool. I have. I mean, I just, you know, I love being outside and, you know, one reason that I'm not trying, you know, one reason that I like to work for TU right now is that I don't have to manage a lot of people and I can be outside a lot. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's awesome. I mean, everybody chooses their path and I think you're right from a young age. I just want to be outside and I want to study these fish and I want to look, the whole reason I do it is because there's some other poor kid. I mean, I grew up pretty poor. There's some other poor kid that's wants to be on that river, you know, studying insects or fish or whatever it is. And hopefully that kid will get a chance to go to college or become a guide or whatever they want. Right. And, yeah. And I want to ensure that the next generation, there's another, another kid, you know, that's like, man, I get to fish this river and that's awesome. That's pretty cool. John, is there something that uh, a cool little story? Cause we can, we can edit this around a little bit. Cause I like to, I think we should end with, that discussion, but, um, is there something that we missed that, uh, that you think you should talk about real quick? W one of the things I'm thinking about is, um, maturity and, uh, chroma, chromatophore. How do you pronounce it? Chromatophores. Yeah. Chromatophores. chromatophores. Do you have a metaphor for your chromatophore, John? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> and then, uh, light, long flies versus short flies. Those are just two things that I was, that are, I had written down that I wanted to talk about, but if there's something that you think we should quickly go over before, before we, we end this. You know, if you want to talk about those, I'm great. Otherwise, I feel like we covered, I mean, yeah. well, so many cool things. And I'm definitely down for doing an on the river or doing another yeah. one. Uh, yeah. Well, t real quick, talk about that. Um, these steelhead was kind of changing their look based on their environment. Yeah. So that's what chromatophore <laughs> so, means. Mm -hmm. Chromatophore. <laughs> ne Necronomicron. So, uh, <laughs> it's 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 one of those terms that man and i don't like saying chromatophore because if i haven't been saying it for a while something you know i usually screw it up and and don't quote me on all of this because i'm not i'm not like a this isn't my wheelhouse but i've done enough research on it to be a little bit dangerous and the question i had was you know you guys have seen it i can catch a, a trout in a river that looks really unique. And then I could catch a trout right next door to it in the same river that looks really different. And so why do some fish have more spots than others? And how do steelhead kind of change their colors or shade of their colors in preparation for saltwater? And the, the most basic answer is that the differences in outward appearance on fish are controlled by the same mechanism that ours is, which is chromatophores. And chromatophores are the little cells that are sensitive to sunlight and that can change in coloration in response to various environmental features, such as maybe your diet or sunlight, or whether you're in a very shady place versus a not shady place. So every animal has these chromatophores. And uh, the example that I've always used is that up on the Olympic Peninsula, where I'm from, we have two, the old timers refer to cutthroat as either being bluebacks or yellow bellies. And they thought they were different, really different life histories and species of fish. And what I tried to, what I 
what I found out after a number of years was that really the fish that come in and look really fresh and chrome, they call bluebacks. But after a few months in fresh water, like a steelhead, they tend to darken up and their, their change in outward appearance becomes more drab and it's more similar to the environment within which they live. And that process is occurring because of physiological changes in the chromatophores themselves. So like we get tan if we're outside and exposed yeah. to sunlight for long periods, or you can be like me and be really pasty white because your legs haven't seen sun <laughs> in 10 years because they've been in waders for 10 years, right? Uh, so basically it's some combination of their environment, but the fish themselves as they prepare for smultification, uh, there's something going on there with the chromatophores that helps them change and become uh, much more silvery. And of course, that process then gets reversed when they come back to fresh water because they're, again, exposed to a very different environment and they're getting a lot more, generally, a lot more sunlight. And their surrounding environment is different. And I'll give people one little, uh, you know, kind of uh, example of this, which is that I spend a lot of time sampling juvenile steelhead. And so we use an electro fisher to catch those juvenile steelhead. And after we catch the fish, we put them in a white bucket in water. And what is interesting, if we're catching them in a pool that is very dark and no sunlight, the fish will all be very dark. And as soon as we put them in the bucket, they turn to a very light coloration within about 30 seconds to a minute. Wow. So that gives you just an example of how quickly some of these fish can change color. And that's not going to happen with a smolt because a smolt is committed to being in the ocean. And part of that coloration change is a much deeper physiological process. Mm -hmm. But these fish can change colors in fresh water really rapidly. That's crazy. It's crazy uh, to see it happen. And uh, so it's just, again, I that's that's a little out of my wheelhouse, so I don't want to claim to know everything. Well, I bet it, it kind of goes with, you know, you can probably recognize a, a fish from the hoe versus a fish from the Solettes. You know, kind of like what totally. we, when we look at a fish on the Trinity, we're like, oh, that's a Trinity River fish. You know, and then when you, you say we, one, you're saying you and, when you look at a fish, <laughs> say, I, I know fuck all about that. <laughs> but it's pretty amazing that you can literally look at some of these fish and the characters involved in like the, and it, whether it's a turbid river or a clear river or a has a lot of sun during the day or if it's in a canyon and shaded like you're talking about you can really see you can start to kind of break down these fish like like uh, like people you know a little bit oh, and it's cool it's, it's pretty neat i'm with you guys and look this is another the one reason i started taking pictures of fish certainly was for the, the first reason for what you said is i'm a kid and i want to share the photograph with my dad to prove i caught something or to my friend right that's like that's our trophy that we take home i mean shit at the root of all this we're hunter gatherers right yeah. and we want to bring something home to the tribe to show them we're good at something and uh but the other reason i started continued to take lots of photographs of steelhead and cutthroat is because within another four to five years we're going to have like really good artificial intelligence programs they're going to be able to take all these photographs and people in 150 years might not know what a washugal river steelhead look like or an american river steelhead and we need something for people to go back to and have a reference of, right? And the other yeah. thing is that artificial intelligence. So photography helps you keep a record, but AI could take photographs from all these different rivers and probably make an amalgamation of what an average steelhead or salmon might look like from this river. And how would that compare to the river next door? And I would argue. Are, I you would just argue. Gave, you just gave Chad a Woody, by the way. No, man, you're you're uh, you're, you're preaching to the choir. We're on this. We awesome. uh, we're actually working on software to do that kind of stuff. Um, Too sweet. Yeah, so we'll we'll definitely have to talk after. But I would I would argue that given enough data and enough catch data specifically, you might even be able to accurately predict predict when fish are most likely to bite, which would be, which would be something yeah. that's never happened before. Yeah, because I of lack of data I, yeah. and no artificial no, intelligence, machine learning. I mean, we're, we're not capable of answering those questions with the statistics that we've developed, right? All the statistics, st statistical procedures that we've developed are basically yes or no. And some go, some go back to the 70s and 60s, you know, like <laughs> I mean, but, but the, it's not the model itself. Right. I think it's it's the the methodology for collecting the data and then the uh, the ability for the, the data collection uh, in terms of the sample size to be large enough. 
I think you're right. Absolutely. Don't, don't get me wrong. I think, I think you're right there. The data is the most important. And, but I think you're right that, you know, I've read a couple papers lately on how artificial intelligence is able to mine different things out of data that, you know, has already been evaluated. Right. Yeah. So you're like, I think you're right. There's something there that it might be able to get at better than our kind of traditional stats. But I also agree that if your data set's big and thorough, any stats will give you a good answer from that yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, just to use like a, a analogy that we can all we can all really understand easily, um, the a a marketer given enough data, credit card data, for example, um, can pretty much um, segment you into a personality type that's that where you're you know and and basically puts you in a segment in a very big 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 data set um puts you in a very small sliver of a segment and understand and, pro and predict what your buying habits are going to be like and your psychographic profile it's pretty crazy it yeah it is amazing i mean you think about what we it's scary yeah the dog it is it's <laughs> the dog just farted over here. Dude, I'm getting blown hey, up. I don't boy. know what Chad feeds his dog. He's got a little hey, bulldog and he's sitting know. underneath me and he's just destroying me right now. And the him. dog never the dog never seems to care, right? The dog's just like, you know, <laughs> good for you. And, and you're you're right. I'll be driving home from the hoe one day and you just smell it. I'm like, dog, yeah. why did you do that? You know? And, I, and yeah, you I give him around a, and yeah. I give him a blend of uh spam and link cut oil daily. <laughs> it smells like that, spam. <laughs> that'll be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, John, this was a, an awesome podcast. We really appreciate your time and, and help dissecting Dude, our spotlight species of steelhead. Don't let us ask go yet. There's one question we haven't asked. What, the eyes? The eyes, man, the eyes, because this gets back to the fish handling stuff. Yeah. Real quick. A, but, uh, well, or not quick, just explain it. He's talking yeah. about how the, and I, I've, I've, we've talked about this way back in the day with, before digital pictures even became is when you were looking at pictures of steelhead or fish, you could see like basically ones that were bonked versus ones that were still alive. And all you had to do was look at their eyes. Is their eye looking down at, at the water? If yes, that fish has a good, you know, it's alive, you know, but if it's looking straight at you, that thing's been bonked and the, pretend somebody's pretending to hold it over the, the doll of, eyes, you know? Totally the doll eyes. So yeah, and I have a post on that, which is, you know, that's always struck me too. And the one reason I did post is because I see a lot of these trout pictures, right? Or a Chinook picture and the guy's like, keep them wet. But the <laughs> Chinook guy's round and it's in the water. I'm like, dude, that like doesn't make much sense. It's already dead. I mean, just who cares if you killed it, right? Or you'd see trout that have these doll eyes. And so basically you're right. The eye tells you it's, it's kind of a signal for the fish's health. And so fish normally have a reflexive action that the that the eye will tilt with the body. So when you tilt the fish to the side, the eye will inherently roll down, and that kind of gives you that that look that you know a, a fish is healthy. And I think that is called like a vestibular ocular reflex, and we call it VOR. And if the eye's rolling down on the fish, it means they're pretty healthy. But if the eye is not rolling and it's just kind of like that doll eye, uh, that means the fish is usually in trouble. And it's been really rare circumstances that I've had a fish with a doll eye recover and survive. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, that was my next question. Can you, can you kind of, um, can, is there things you can do to get that, that fish lucid again? N not much. You know, I've spent there, boy, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes before trying to recover fish. And it just seems that probably 95, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's, it's more than nine out of 10 are dying because I can only think of a handful of times I've ever got a fish to recover. And in those times I had like all day to waste and I would just build a little rock wall of rocks in the river and just let it there. Right. And then yeah. at one point during the day, I turned around and the fish is trying to get out of there. So, okay. But most of the time, possible, if you see doll eyes, yeah. the spirit has left the body. The spirit has probably left the body. If it's a fish you can retain, it's better to take it home. And if not, you know, yeah. some animal will eat it. But yeah, it's really hard to get them back because that's kind of like their last reflex, right? That goes away. Mm. Okay. Uh, but hope, I will say I this. That made sense to everybody. I think it, it does, right? Yeah. yeah. Like basically if you, you know, the eye should rotate to keep in pitch with the body. And so when people look that's at a fish's eye, they, they often wonder why it's rolled down into its head. Yeah. Right. And the doll eye is like the fish's eye is completely round and not rolled down at all. And yeah, I will, I will say this, that some fish like, uh, bull trout and Lahunt and cutthroat, 
I see more doll eyes in them, but I'm not always sure they're actually dead because some of those fish get really large and they get really fat. Yeah. And I almost wonder if it's just like, so there are rare occasions when you might not want to tear into somebody's ass for bad handling <laughs> yeah. or it's a dead fish, right? Cause you yeah. don't know, be, but yeah, you're right. So before you go on your Facebook or, or uh, Instagram rant on a, on a fish that's being handled, you might want to just look at the eyes. Um, yeah. The, what, 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 damn it. I was going to make a point shit and it's in the air it's it's in the wind i forget <laughs> um happens i'll think of it in a second right after i hit stop um go ahead nick you have something. no i was just gonna wrap it up even though i don't want to i want to keep uh on these steelhead conversations and like you said, you said uh, two hours we have 10 more minutes i gotta go get the the, right, the booger face um damn it what was it okay <laughs> maybe it is time to wrap it up cool. <laughs> all right well John, thank you very much for coming on the show. Um, we're definitely going to come up there. It Let's is up do it. I want to see. We've got a buddy up there too, so it might make make sense to bring a, two drift boats. And do you have a drift boat? I assume you do. I, I don't. No, man. Okay. I I have like I I walk mostly to avoid the boat, but I'll, I'll go. I have a little one man boat. Well, we're going to walk with you. Yeah, we're walking with you. We're walking. With <laughs> you. Yeah. No, we'll go. We'll go use dr boats too, man. Like you know, mainly because I fish alone. If I was fishing yeah. with more people more often, I would definitely have a boat. Cool. Um, let's do it. Well, I, I I feel like I could talk to you for four more hours, man. Seriously, I feel so I feel the same with you guys. You have like awesome questions and. Thank you. To me, it's just like we all, and you're really smart and you get it. I mean, to me, it's like we all want the same thing, more fish. And yeah. to ensure that we at least have a fishery and that, you know, hopefully the next generation does. And I just really appreciate it because one thing I've loved about this job is now I get to meet people like you all. And so I'm happy I've gotten on Instagram. Likewise, because, man. Uh, we talk about awesome. that all the time. Well, su you yeah. know, support TU, support Cal Trout, support all these, totally. uh, you know, organizations support. that are doing the, gr the good things, you know, for these, these different ecosystems and, and um, species. Oh, you know? I I remember what I was going to, the point I was going to make. Oh shit. Uh, here we go. You, I got five. I'll do two minutes. Okay. So the, the doll eyes, right? The doll yeah, eye thing. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, those 3d eyes that are coming out for streamers. Right. Um, if you look at those 3d eyes, they're all doll eyes. Do you think that's going to matter? And would you want it like a, a, a 3d eye that's got m more of a lucid look to it? Dude, that's a good question. Maybe you could you could probably do a lot of different colors with the eyes to try and trick that fish into thinking that fish is actually screwed and dying, right? Yeah. So I like that, man. You should manipulate. You could probably get little, little, you know, really red kind of drawn out eyes. Yeah, because if you it, could probably if, have. Yeah, I mean, if you got a little smolt that looks like it's kind of stunned or just kind of easy. Yeah, you can see, that's what I was the getting. Eyes, at, the like, cue, yeah. Yeah, they like marijuana the is legal up here in Washington and Oregon, so maybe those little fish are a little, hot, a little too black. You're saying <laughs> hot box them before you hook them in the snout and throw them in the water. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are awesome, nice. but I think you're you you should definitely take advantage and make you know you should definitely make the eyes doll eyes on those things so the fish look sweet. You know, yeah, I like that, man. That's a good idea. All right, well, cool. Um, yeah, uh, do you have a minute after the podcast? I want to just give you a call. Yeah, totally. Okay, totally. cool. Well, hey, you guys, thanks for listening. Uh, we went almost two hours, and we could have went another two. Uh, really appreciate the support. Uh, we got a lot of stuff coming up. We'll make some announcements for pretty soon. In the meantime, support Cal Trout and TU. We also have hats for sale geared up, ardless.co. And you can follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, um, or just uh, not do any of that and keep listening. Anything else? Thanks a lot, John, for your time. Appreciate it, man. Uh, thanks, both you guys. I love you, man. All right. Special thanks to our sponsors. Without them, this show would not be possible. And thanks for listening. If you have ideas or any questions for the show, send an email to fishon at barbless.co or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash the barbless podcast and tap on the visit group link. Also, be sure to follow us on Instagram at barbless.co or find us on YouTube. Thanks for listening.